Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 65, The Athenian Acropolis. The Athenian Acropolis dominates the countryside of Attica for miles around. In early times, it functioned as a palace, a sanctuary, and a fortress. It continued to be used for defensive purposes until it was sacked by the Persians in 479 BC. All of the temples that had been erected previously were destroyed, and little trace of them survives today, apart from a few fragments of architectural sculpture. For 40 years, the Acropolis remained in its ruined condition, as a testimony to Persian barbarism. But by the middle of the 5th century BC, when the Athenians were at the peak of their political power, thanks to the tribute paid by their subject allies, Athens was also becoming a very wealthy city. And so Pericles decided to funnel some of the excess money in the Delian League treasury, that being around 5,000 talents at that point, to initiate a building program to replace the many temples in the Acropolis and throughout Attica that had been wrecked by the Persians. Other funds came from the financial reserves of the goddess Athena, whose sanctuaries, like those of the other gods throughout Greece, received both private donations and public support. The Greeks had all sworn the oath of Plataea, saying that they wouldn't rebuild those temples, burnt by the Persians, until the threat was removed. Well, as we mentioned in episode 43, with the de facto peace with Persia now in place, Pericles had called together a meeting in the spring of 449 BC, with the outcome that they decreed to rebuild the temples to the gods that had been destroyed, so that they could give adequate thanks to the gods for saving Greece at such a perilous time, and for their recent prosperities. Pericles saw too that the prestige of the city would be greatly increased by such beautiful and impressive public buildings. In doing so, his employment for a vast number of workers was provided at the state's expense, and thus was a sound policy for a statesman relying on popular support. Plutarch, in his Life of Pericles, tells of the energy and enthusiasm which went into the project. Quote, So the works arose, towering in size, unsurpassed in shape or grace, with the workmen competing to excel themselves in the beauty of their craftsmanship. The most remarkable thing was the speed. Men thought that each building would only be completed after many successive generations, but all of them reached perfection in the peak period of a single government. End quote. His building program, though, was not without controversy. In fact, some of Pericles' enemies accused him of tricking Athens out with jewelry, as if she were a high priced Tyra. Regardless, he persisted, and ultimately he turned Athens into the most glorious city in all of the Greek world. The center of the building program was, of course, the Acropolis. In the center stood a 30-foot bronze statue of Athena Promachos, or Athena who fights in the front line. The goddess was portrayed standing, with her left hand holding her shield and her right arm holding her spear. The shield was decorated with images of the Centauromachi. Put up to celebrate the victory over the Persians, this was an enormous bronze figure of the goddess that faced southwestward and could be seen by sailors far out to sea, rounding Cape Sunion, as her helmet and spear gleamed in the sunlight. Its enormous size and expense expresses the innovative and confident spirit of the Athenian Empire in the mid-5th century BC. It was built between 450 and 448 BC by Phidias, who also created the huge statue of Zeus at Olympia that we discussed in episodes 58 and 59. In fact, Phidias had gained a reputation amongst his contemporaries as the greatest sculptor of the gods and was even a close friend of Pericles. A new temple was needed for the city's patron goddess, Athena, so Pericles commissioned the two architects, Ictinos and Callicrates, to build a larger temple to Athena Parthenos, or Athena the Virgin, better known as the Parthenon, on the site of the destroyed Old Parthenon, which was the name given to it by scholars. While they used some of the building material remaining from the Old Parthenon, the new version was built bigger and better. In fact, it would become the most important surviving building of classical Greece, as it is generally considered to represent the zenith of the Doric order, and its decorative sculptures are considered by some to be the highest points of Greek art. The Parthenon is regarded as an enduring symbol of ancient Greece, of Athenian democracy, and of Western civilization, and to this day is considered one of the world's greatest cultural monuments. The architectural plan was drawn up by the gifted architect Ictinos, while another expert architect, Callicrates, superintended the execution of the plan, both working in tandem. Only the foundations and some column drums from the old Parthenon were deemed usable by the architects. They then extended the foundations to accommodate a much larger plan. At the same time, they were careful to preserve a venerable shrine of Athena Ergene, or Athena the Worker, another one of her aspects worshipped on the Acropolis, by incorporating it into the northern peristyle of the new building. 
Athena Ergenay's interest in the work of the sculptors and masons was indispensable. Construction began on the Parthenon in 447 BC, and it was finished nine years later in 438 BC, although decoration of the building continued until 432 BC. It would take thousands of laborers and skilled craftsmen to create this magnificent temple. Some of the financial accounts for the Parthenon survive in the form of inscriptions, which was a standard thing to do for building projects. These inscriptions would have served various purposes. It would have stipulated the various contracts for building and supplying the materials, and it was also a form of public accounting to record how much money was being spent. For this project, they used only the finest of materials. Instead of the import of typical Parian marble, the Athenians employed beautiful white pentelic marble from Mount Pentelikos, which is located about 10 miles from Athens. And these accounts showed that the transportation of this white marble was the largest single expense for its construction. We also know that the construction of the Parthenon cost in total 469 talents. A talent is divided into 60 minai, according to the Attic Eubean weight standard, and a minai could be divided into 100 drachmae. We think then that it would have been around 2,814,000 drachmae to build this structure. According to other evidence, a drachma was approximately one day's wage for an average ancient Greek worker. So as a state project, this was a colossally expensive undertaking and was one of the most expensive temples ever built. Although the Parthenon is considered to be the greatest Doric peripteral temple, meaning it had columns running all around its sides, it differs from the other Doric temples in various unusual ways. In the first place, it's what we call octastyle, meaning it has eight columns across the front, instead of the standard six, or hexastyle. This is already a sign that we are dealing with a very big temple, as it is two columns wider. This octastyle was more common with Ionic temples in Asia Minor, in places like Ephesus, where they built the colossal temple to Artemis. Furthermore, it had a second row of six columns on the front and back. Its arrangement of 17 columns along the side is typical of the Doric style, though. Although the Greeks typically did not mix and match their orders, sometimes we see Ionic elements in Doric temples, and this is what took place with the Parthenon, as it basically has a Doric exterior and an Ionian interior, which is a much more decorative order. We see a row of four Ionic columns in the interior that enclosed Athena's sacred treasures. Another atypical feature of a traditional Doric temple is the Ionic-style frieze between the two rows of columns that would have been visible to viewers who walked up onto the three steps of the stylobate or platform, that enclosed the temple. In addition, the Parthenon was built entirely of marble, even the roof tiles, when all other temples at that time would have used terracotta. For comparison's sake, the Parthenon is about two-thirds the size of a football field. Its outer dimensions are 228 feet long by 101 feet wide. The first challenge in constructing the Parthenon was in the cleaving of the marble from Mount Pentelikos, which was about 10 miles away, as we mentioned. In all, about 30,000 tons of the fine white stone was needed. In the quarry, workers used the natural cracks of the stone to separate giant slabs from the mountainside. The first step in doing this was to locate these cracks and to calculate if that piece of marble was sufficient for a specific purpose. The second step was to put within these cracks an iron wedge, and then to hammer on it constantly to cause further cracking. Once the giant slabs were ready to be removed, gangs of men would use levers, ropes, and pulleys to maneuver the marble and prepare the stone for transportation to the Acropolis. But as one might expect, accidents weren't uncommon. There was an enormous risk that this huge block could slide out of control and kill many people underneath. But cutting and transporting the marble from the side of the mountain was only half the battle in the construction of the Parthenon. Engineers then had to answer the question of how to lift these 10-ton marble behemoths on top of one another to create the columns and interior walls. Each column consisted of 11 separate drums, stacked one on top of the other. They were carved so that they would perfectly fit when laid together on a column. In order to do this, the top of each drum was divided into four concentric circles, with each ring either being smoothed or roughed out, depending on the amount of grip needed to interlock with the next drum. In the center of each drum, masons cut a rectangular notch, measuring about four to six inches squared and three to four inches deep. Carpenters then inserted wooden plugs into the notches, which served to align and center each drum with the one above it. The next challenge was in lifting the enormously heavy drums, especially those for the upper sections of the columns. A single column of the Parthenon could weigh between 63 and 119 tons. They used a crane in which a series of pulleys allowed them to pull up a weight of 10 tons by only having to pull down 100 kilograms. Engineers attached the stone to the crane in one of several ways. 
The method most often used was to tie the end of a rope to the top part of a metal S-hook, fasten shorter ropes to the bottom of the hook, and then loop these around small protruding knobs, called bosses, that had been left uncut from the marble for this specific purpose. Typically, four bosses would be left surrounding the drum, evenly distributing the force needed to hoist the object. The walls and closing interior spaces had to be laid down with extreme precision, since the builders did not use mortar. In order to hold the ends of each block together, builders hollowed out the ends in a double T design. Then, iron rods were inserted to clamp them together. After the columns and blocks were put in place, the bosses used to lift them were chipped off and smoothed over. The Parthenon was seen as the ideal building, adhering to exact mathematical measures based off of a systematic equation. The Greeks believed that man was the measure of perfection, and so they used their own arms and feet for the measurements of the Parthenon. Ectinus and Callicrates adhered to the ratio of 1 to 2.25, which was used to create harmony and balance throughout the design, in that the stylobate, the base upon which the columns stand, has a length that is 2.25 times longer than its width. The spacing between each column is 2.25 times wider than the diameter of a single column, and the width of the facade is 2.25 times its height. Ictinus and Callicrates also knew that from a distance, the eye would perceive perfectly straight columns as being thin in the middle and appearing to fall outwards, and a perfectly horizontal foundation would appear to droop towards the center. So they took great steps to create an optical illusion. A subtle curve or swelling, called entasis, of the stylobate makes it so that the center of each side of the temple was slightly higher than the corners. This made it impossible to see an object from one side to the other. Also, the space between each corner column and the one next to it is slightly narrower than the rest. The corner columns themselves also are marginally wider than the rest, and they all slant inwards ever so slightly. Plans have been found at the Temple of Apollo and Didyma that show how they achieved this, as each column's curve was a fraction of a millimeter different. The result is that the temple has no right angles at all and does not appear to sag on each side, but gives an optical illusion of having perfect dimensions from afar. The Parthenon is also famous for its sculptures. There were pedimental groups at the front and back and sculpted metopes on the sides. There was the continuous ionic frieze on the interior and the great statue of Athena herself. As we mentioned, Phidias was considered the premier sculptor of classical Greece, and he was also a personal friend of Pericles. And so, due to his skill and his connections, he was placed in charge of the sculptured decorations of the Parthenon. In fact, according to Plutarch, he was in charge of the entire Periclean building program. He was already famous for a statue of Zeus in his temple at Olympia and his statue on the Athenian Acropolis of Athena Promachos, both of which we have already discussed. Although he only supervised the work of the other sculptors in the Parthenon, he himself made the great statue of Athena Parthenos, found inside the cella of the temple, which was not only the perceived home of the divinity, but was also the location of the Athenian treasury, as well as that of the Delian League, after it was moved from Delos. It's important to make clear, though, that this was not the cult statue. That was ultimately kept in the Erechtheion, which we will get to shortly, and was supposedly made out of wood from the sacred olive tree of Athena. Phidias, though, didn't deal in marble, but with chryselephantine, a combination of gold, silver, and ivory, as well as in bronze. The Parthenon was an extremely expensive building, but this statue inside of it was almost equal in cost to the building itself. The statue portrayed Athena holding Nike, the winged goddess of victory. It stood nearly 29 feet, or 9 meters high, and its immense size was the reason that the cella was designed to be larger than usual. The statue no longer exists today, but reconstructions have been made based off of details found in Pausanias and Pliny. These authors are also how we know of his other two famous works. Pausanias writes, quote, The statue is created with ivory and gold. On the middle of her helmet is a likeness of the Sphinx, and on either side of the helmet are griffins in relief. The statue of Athena is upright, with a tunic reaching to her feet, and on her breast, the head of Medusa is worked in ivory. She holds a statue of Nike that is approximately four cubits high, and in the other hand a spear. At her feet lies a shield, and near the spear is a serpent. This serpent would be Erechthonius. On the pedestal is the birth of Pandora in relief. End quote. Although Pausanias doesn't mention it, there also was rumors swirling around Athens that the images of Phidias and Pericles were on the shield. In addition, we have representations of the statue on coins, reproductions of it as miniature sculptures as votive offerings, and representations of it on engraved gems. 
The 2nd century AD Roman reconstruction, called the Varvakion Athena, a much smaller statue housed in the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, is generally considered to be the most faithful reproduction of Phidias' statue, and would be the basis for the replica in the Nashville Parthenon today. It was probably during the Hurley invasion in the 3rd century AD, which caused severe fire damage to the Parthenon, that reduced the gold and ivory statue of Athena to a pile of carbonized rubble and lost to history. Although the sculptures of the pediments were seen by Pausanias, he oddly enough barely describes them, and says nothing of the Metopes and the Ionic frieze. The figures on the east pediment were badly damaged when the Parthenon was converted into a Christian church, and the west pediment was almost completely wrecked when the Venetian general Morosini tried to remove them in the 17th century, only to have them come crashing to the ground. However, thankfully, they had been drawn completely by a French artist named Jacques Carrie. A decade prior, and so his drawings are immensely valuable. In addition, he drew some of the metopes and some of the frieze. The figures on the East Pediment contain scenes from the birth of Athena. The surviving fragments are preserved in the British Museum of London, although they are very badly damaged. We described her birth in great detail in the last episode. In the center, Athena is shown fully armed and standing next to her father Zeus, from whose head she had just emerged. On both sides, the Olympian gods draw back at the sight of her birth. Unfortunately, the centerpieces of the pediment were destroyed during the cannonball blast. More on that shortly. But the main Olympian gods must have stood around Zeus and Athena, watching the wondrous event, with Hera and Hermes, or Hephaestus, probably near them. In the surviving fragments on the left corner is Helios and his horses. Helios' arms and the head of his horses rise increasingly from the left. Even in its ruined state, we can see a magnificently sculpted piece of artwork. On the far right side of that same pediment is found the bodies of women. They are now headless, but have been interpreted as the three goddesses, Hestia, Dione, and Aphrodite. This is a dynamic, naturalistic sculpture, because much energy was spent on the clothing with drapery clinging to their body as if soaked by water. The sculptor manipulated the marble to show texture and movement, as their knees and feet appear to protrude. The intricacies of this make it a masterpiece of high classical sculpture. The final surviving fragment is the head of the horse of Cellini's chariot. In contrast to Helios and his horses on the left, the horse of Cellini, the goddess of the moon, hangs its head over the right corner as the moon descends out of sight. And so between Helios and Cellini, we see the rising of the sun and the setting of the moon. Furthermore, an image of Iris, the personification of the rainbow and a heavenly messenger deity, was shown, going forth to carry the good news to the ends of the world. The sculpture of the West Pediment illustrates the contest between Athena and Poseidon for the patronage and namesake of the city of Athens. We described this myth in great detail in episode 24, so there's no point in rehashing it out here. These pediments no longer exist, but we have 17th century drawings of them before they were destroyed, as we previously mentioned. Athena and Poseidon appear at the center of the composition, diverging from one another in strong diagonal forms, with the goddess holding the olive tree and the god of the sea raising his trident to strike the earth. At their flanks, they are framed by two active groups of horses pulling chariots, while a crowd of legendary personalities from Athenian mythology fills the space out to the acute corners of the pediment. One is thought to be the early king of Athens, Cecrops, identified by the coiled snake beside him. At the northern and southern ends recline the two river gods, Eridanus and Ilissus, each at the side that was nearest to his own waters. The figures throughout both of these pediments are sculpted in natural movement with bodies full of vital energy that burst through their flesh, as the flesh in turn bursts through their thin clothing. Their chitons reveal the body underneath as the focus of the composition. The distinction between gods and humans is blurred in the conceptual interplay between the idealism and naturalism bestowed on the stone by the sculptors. The Parthenon had two friezes, an outer Doric and an inner Ionic. The Doric frieze consists of triglyphs alternating with 92 metopes, 14 each on the east and west sides, and 32 on the north and south sides, all filled with relief sculpture depicting scenes of mythical battles, all of which should be well known by this point. The Gigantomachy on the east above the main entrance, the Centauromachy on the south, the Amazonomachy on the west, and the Trojan War on the north, although those are poorly preserved. As at Olympia, the subject matters were vivid metaphors that meant to emphasize the contrast between the Greeks and their barbarian enemies. 
that being the triumph of Greek values, civilization, and culture over barbarian chaos and incivility. In fact, one of these events is put up on every single temple that the Athenians created in Attica in this period. And so we usually view this as an analogy for the Greeks fighting the Persians as a metaphor in their recent history. Although the Metopes on the north, east, and west have suffered serious damage, those on the south side, depicting the Centauramachi, are better preserved. Several of the Metopes still remain on the building, but some have been relocated to the Acropolis Museum, most to the British Museum, and one is at the Louvre Museum, while others are missing entirely due to 2,500 years of war, pollution, erratic conservation, pillage, and vandalism. There will be more on that shortly. One Metope in particular has a lapith leaping forward and laterally as he grabs the centaur with his left hand. The scene is dominated by the tension of the fight and the drapery folds that form the backdrop to the human torso. Unlike the outer Doric frieze, the inner Ionic frieze above the inner colonnade is a continuous band of narrative. On the west, north, and south friezes, there are depictions of men on horseback, those carrying vessels on foot, musicians, and sacrificial animals, cattle, and sheep. On the east frieze, where the cella opened, there are women on each side slowly moving towards the center of the composition. The twelve Olympian gods are seated, six on each side, of the center image. Two young women are on the side of an older woman, who is often identified as the priestess of Athena Polius, and to the right of them, a man, perhaps the Basileus Archon, receives a garment from a young boy. And so it is usually believed to be an idealized representation of the Panathenaic procession, culminating with the presentation of the peplos by a priest to the statue of Athena. The gods are shown as being much larger, which is usually interpreted as them viewing the procession from Mount Olympus. Zeus sits on the one side of Athena, and Hephaestus on the other. The fact that humans were being shown in the same plane as the gods was seen as audacious, portraying the perceived superiority that the Athenians had for themselves during their golden age. While this is the opinion of most scholars, it's not universally believed because there are some problems with the interpretation. First, a non-mythological event is not conclusively portrayed on any other temples. We also get descriptions of the Panathenaic festival from the literary sources, and in them, there are some discrepancies with what is shown on the temple. For example, there are horsemen, but we don't see foot soldiers. In the literary sources, females carried water jars during the procession, but on the Parthenon, they are males. One interpretation to get around these discrepancies is that we are looking at a generic procession, rather than a specific type of one. Others have looked particularly at the central scene, and have tried to interpret it in a mythological way suggesting that it shows a procession when Erechtheus had to sacrifice a virgin daughter to Athena to ward off an enemy army. Others make it even more historical and suggest that what we are looking at is another commemoration of the Battle of Marathon, and the heroes were displayed as horsemen in a more heroic form. This theory interestingly counts 192 figures in the frieze, the same number of Athenians that was said by Herodotus to have been killed at Marathon. However, this number is problematic because it depends on how you count the figures and who you include and exclude. Needless to say, the interpretation is still inconclusive and the jury is still out, but it is something that has been argued over extensively. Regardless, it seems more likely to me at least that the scholarly majority is correct here. Another important issue about this inner ionic freeze is its visibility or lack thereof. It's all nice looking and easy to study now that the reliefs are hanging at eye level in one of the various museums. But for the Athenians of the 5th century BC, it sat behind a colonnade that was about 40 feet high. And although it would have been painted, it still must have been pretty dark and shadowy. So it would have been extremely difficult to view and understand, and that perhaps is another factor in this discussion. Since an ancient Athenian wouldn't have been able to get a good view of it, why did Phidias even bother to put a very expensive piece of decoration that you wouldn't normally find on a temple, in a place you couldn't see it very well? Furthermore, there has never been an altar found for the Parthenon. That is not to say that one didn't exist, but we would expect to find some evidence of it somewhere, even if it's just markings on the stone where its foundations would have been in the bedrock. This is important because an altar was where all the sacrificial rituals took place. So it is odd not to have one. We also don't hear anything really about the personnel to do with the Parthenon. We would expect, especially, to hear something about a priestess, but we don't have any evidence that a priestess operated in the temple. When combining all of this with Phidias' creation of the massive statue of Athena Parthenos that didn't even serve as the cult statue of Athena, this may lead you to ask what was its actual function, if not religious then. 
This clearly was a very ostentatious, expensive temple, and it held the treasury of the Delian League, in addition to many conquered Persian items, so many scholars have interpreted this as simple propaganda for Athenian disposable wealth and power. Because it was such a powerful symbol of Athenian identity and superiority, every time Athens was attacked, the Parthenon too was targeted. Most notably, it was burned by Germanic tribes in the 3rd century AD, resulting in the timber roof collapsing and much damage to the interior. Repairs, though, were made in the 4th century AD, possibly during the reign of the Roman Emperor Julian the Apostate. A new wooden roof, covered with clay tiles, was installed to cover the sanctuary. At some point in the 5th century AD, after Theodosius II decreed that all pagan temples in the Byzantine Empire were to be closed, Athena's great statue, the one made by Phidias that stood in the Parthenon, was looted and taken to Constantinople. It would be destroyed five centuries later. During the Byzantine era, many people began to live on the Acropolis, with the result that in the late 6th century AD, it was converted to an Eastern Orthodox Christian church dedicated to Parthenos Maria, or the Virgin Mary. This was a very common practice with ancient religious buildings. It's what we call continuity of use. In other words, once a building, area, or site was designated as sacred, it stayed sacred even if the religion changes. And that happened quite a lot with Greco-Roman temples. Of course, alterations would be made. The Byzantine Greeks, for example, moved the entrance to the west side, and the temple's internal space was altered with the addition of walls and apse and doorways. They also lined its insides with Christian-themed decorations in the form of Byzantine icons. Interestingly, you can still see many Christian inscriptions carved into its columns. Many of its nude statues at this point were either removed and destroyed or reinterpreted according to a Christian theme. The result was that the Parthenon became an important Christian pilgrimage of the Byzantine Empire. Further changes took place during the Crusades when it came under Latin occupation and became the Roman Catholic Cathedral of Our Lady. During this period, a watchtower and a spiral staircase were constructed at the southwest corner. After the Ottoman Turkish conquest of Athens in the 15th century, it was converted into a mosque, and by this point, the Acropolis was entirely covered with houses and was fortified. Despite all of the alterations accompanying its religious conversions, the structure of the Parthenon had remained basically intact. In 1674, a Frenchman called Jacques Carrey had visited Athens and he made a very important set of drawings of the Parthenon, its pediments, and friezes. This is very fortunate because 13 years later, in 1687, during the Second Turkish-Phoenician War, tragedy would strike the Parthenon. During this point, the mosque was used to store gunpowder because the Turks believed that the Venetians wouldn't target a building of such historic and religious importance. Well, they were wrong, and Venetian cannonballs made contact with the Parthenon, setting off a huge explosion that destroyed its central portion, including 40 feet of the eastern pediment. In fact, parts of the Parthenon were found as much as a mile away. Six columns from the south side fell, eight from the north, and whatever remained from the eastern porch, except for one column. When the Venetians gained control of the Acropolis, the Venetian commander Morosini then tried to extract loot from the ruins. As he tried to remove the sculptures of the western pediment, the pulley system that he was using snapped and crashed to the ground, completely destroying them. After the Turks recaptured the Acropolis, a small mosque was built inside the ruined temple in 1708. The rest was then looted for its stone for military use. The 18th century saw Ottoman stagnation, and many Europeans began to flock to the Parthenon and began painting its picturesque ruins, spurring a rise of Philhellenism. In 1801, Lord Elgin, British ambassador to Istanbul, obtained questionable permission from the Ottoman Sultan to make casts and drawings of the antiquities on the Acropolis, to demolish recent buildings if it was necessary to view the antiquities, and to remove sculptures from them. And so he acquired many of the surviving statues and frieze reliefs and shipped them back to London. They were sold to the British Museum in 1816, which is now where they reside, and are known as the Elgin Marbles by the British, and as the Parthenon Marbles by the Greeks. Greece won its independence in 1832, and soon all the medieval and Ottoman buildings on the Acropolis were destroyed. Eventually, the Acropolis became a heritage site in 1854. Since 1983, the Greek government has been committed to get the stolen works back, but to no avail, as the British Museum argues that Elgin had legal title to them from the Turks, and that by housing them in their museum, they have preserved them from the terrible effects of acid rain and air pollution that affects modern-day Athens as well as looters, private collectors, and random pot shots from soldiers. 
They also argue that they are now part of British heritage, and their return would set a dangerous precedent that could result in the stripping of the galleries of many major museums. The Greeks, and those who are in favor of their return to Athens, argue that the Turks had no moral authorization to sell Greek sculptures. The structure of the Parthenon was irreparably damaged by their removal. Their creation of the new Acropolis Museum permits them to keep them in just as safe of a space as the British Museum, and their recovery of them would mean that the whole collection would once again be complete, as it was intended to be. More recently, the Parthenon has been undergoing a restoration project in order to piece it back together due to centuries of neglect and abuse. What do you think? Should they stay in Britain or be returned to Greece? Does the new Acropolis Museum, built in 2009, not a stone's throw away from the Acropolis, tip the balance? Whose heritage are they? Do they belong to Greece or to the world? Those are all questions that many people have been vigorously fighting over to this day. Not in the least because the Parthenon was seen as a symbol of the greatest of human virtues, heroism and civil virtue, which were high ideals in art and politics. And as such, it became the model for many governmental buildings, national monuments, and even some homes. Replicas have been built in Germany, Scotland, and in the United States, in Nashville, Tennessee. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is powered by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by Great Courses Plus. As listeners to this podcast, I know you love learning, discovering new things, which is why I recommend signing up for the Great Courses Plus. This is unlimited access to learn from brilliant, engaging professors about anything that interests you. There's over 8,500 lectures on everything from history and science to cooking or chess. The options are endless. You can watch the Great Courses Plus from any TV, laptop, tablet, and smartphone, or stream the audio with the Great Courses Plus app. In the theme of today's episode, I recommend watching Understanding Greek and Roman Technology. It's a really interesting course, a deeper look into Greek and Roman civilization through their technological innovations, fascinating exploration into their feats of ingenuity, and the lasting effect their engineering has had on the modern world. Two episodes in particular are on how the Greeks quarried the stone and perfected the masonry to build their exquisite temples. Those episodes are fascinating and a great complement to today's podcast. I want you to experience The Great Courses Plus too, and right now they're giving my listeners unlimited access to enjoy all of their courses free for one month. But you need to sign up through my special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Greece. Get started today. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Greece. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Greece. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. At the western end of the Acropolis, the architect Menesicles designed an approach and gateway called the Propylaea of suitable dignity for the sacred area of Athens. It literally means that which is before the gates, from the prefix pro and the plural of pili. The smaller original had been destroyed by the Persians, but the newer model would be more imposing and more welcoming to Athena's famous sanctuary. Construction began in 437 BC but was never finished, with work stopping five years later, in 432 BC, as a result of the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. Furthermore, the new archaeological plan infringed on the sacred precincts of Artemis Brauronia, just atop the Acropolis, more on that shortly, and the adjacent enclosure of Athena Nike, and the priests of these two goddesses raised objections so that the grand plan of Menesicles was only partially carried out. Regardless, the newer unfinished Propylaea was a multifunctional composition containing the Ionic Order on the inside and the Doric on the outside. The core is the central building, which presented the standard six-column Doric facade, both to those entering and departing. There is no surviving evidence of sculpture in the pediments, but the ceiling was famous in antiquity, though. About six centuries later, Pausanias said that to his day, it was unrivaled. It consisted of marble blocks carved in the shape of ceiling coffers and painted blue with gold stars. The central building also contains the gate wall, about two-thirds of the way through it. There are five gates in the wall, one for the central passageway, which was not paved and lays along the natural level of the ground, and two others on either side that were paved. On either side of the central passageway was a trio of ionic columns. The Propylaea is the first building that we know of to have both Doric and Ionic colonnades visible at the same time, and is also the first monumental building in the Classical period to be more complex than a simple rectangle or cylinder, 
The central passageway was the culmination of the sacred way, which led to the Acropolis from Eleusis. An entrance onto the Acropolis was controlled by the Propylaea. Though it was not built as a fortified structure, it was important that people not ritually cleansed be denied access to the sanctuary. In addition, runaway slaves and other miscreants could not be permitted into the sanctuary, where they could claim the protection of the gods. The state treasury was also kept up on the Acropolis, inside the Parthenon, as we have discussed, making its security of the utmost importance. The Propylaea also had two wings. The Pinacotheke was the northwest wing that served as a picture gallery and possibly as a rest area or banquet room. In fact, it was famous in antiquity as the location of paintings of important Greek battles. Pausanias reports that many of them, if not all, were created by Polygnotus, a famous painter who we discussed in episode 57. They would have been painted on wooden panels attached to the wall. The Pinacotheke rested on four steps. The three upper steps were of pentelic marble, while the lowest was of dark Eleusinian limestone. The eastern wing was never finished, though, as the wall surfaces were not trimmed to their finished shapes. The Propylaea survived intact through the Roman and Byzantine periods, but it was severely damaged by a self-inflicted explosion of a powder magazine by the Venetians some 30 years before the Parthenon received even more grievous damage. The result was that the ceiling collapsed. Afterwards, much of the southwest wing was built into a Frankish tower, which stood until the late 19th century. Today, the Propylaea has been partly restored and is still ongoing, and serves as the entrance once again to the Acropolis for the thousands of tourists who visit each year. The southwest wing of the Propylaea seems to only have functioned as an access route to the small Ionic temple of Athena Nike, or Athena as goddess of victory, again to celebrate their victory over the Persians which was built further to the southwest on a raised platform. An inscription on the temple identifies Callicrates as the architect, and it is the earliest fully Ionic temple in the Acropolis. It contrasts neatly with the Doric order of the gateway itself. An earlier model was felled by the Persians, and construction on the newer temple began in 449 BC. But at the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, it was constructed in stages as war-starved funding allowed until it was finally completed during the Peace of Nicias, around 420 BC. In contrast to the Acropolis proper, which was walled off by the central gateway of the Propylaea, the sanctuary could be entered by anyone, and it was most likely built because it was important for the Athenians to pray to Athena Nike for victory during the Peloponnesian War. An Athenian standing on the platform could see Salamis and Agina out in the distance. His eyes could range along the Argolid coastline to the distant citadel of Corinth and the mountains of the Megarid. Under the shadow of the Temple of Victory, he could lose himself in memories of the glory of the distant past and dreams of hope for the end of the Peloponnesian War and Athens' return to empire. The Ionic Temple of Athena Nike has two porches, with four Ionic columns on each of the front and rear facades. A nearly square cella is entered through a doorway, flanked with square pillars. A statue of Athena Nike would have sat inside the cella. A continuous Ionic frieze possibly it depicts scenes of the Persian Wars, not a mythological scene. We can't be for certain, but this may be the one rare case where a historical event is actually portrayed on a religious temple, besides the Parthenon, depending on your interpretation there, that is. Anyways, if this is true, then it would be an appropriate subject matter for a temple celebrating Athena's role in Athens' military victories. The North Frieze seems to depict a battle between two sets of Greeks, both employing cavalry. The South Frieze shows Greek hoplites fighting Persians, in what seems to be the decisive victory at Plataea. The East Frieze shows an assembly of Athena, Zeus, and Poseidon, and so the temple might be rendering Athenian religious beliefs and reverence for the gods bound up in the social and political climate of this period. About a decade later, around 410 BC, a three feet high parapet was built that surrounds the north and west sides of the Ionic Temple of Athena Nike in order to prevent those who visited the temple from falling off the steep bastion down the cliff. The outside of this parapet was adorned with sculpted reliefs showing a parade of Nike figures doing various activities in procession, and seated Athenas sat on each side. They are figures shown doing everyday effortless activities. For example, a sculpture of Nike tying her sandal, which is easily identified from her wings, is still visible despite heavy damage. She is clothed in wet drapery, but becomes more revealing as she bends down and her right shoulder is bare as the chiton slips a subtly erotic image. 
Some scholars have argued that these effortless activities by the personification of victory was meant to portray the everyday effortless victories of the Athenians during the period. In terms of the late Peloponnesian War, though, this certainly was not the case. The temple sat undisturbed during the Roman and Byzantine periods, but the two walls were completely demolished by the Ottoman Turks, who used the stones to build defenses. After the independence of Greece, the temple's walls were reconstructed. Its frieze was later removed and placed in the Acropolis Museum in order to preserve it. Access to the temple is often closed to visitors today, as restoration works are still ongoing. Finally, the Ionic Temple known as the Erechtheion sits opposite of the Parthenon to the north as an unobtrusive Ionic counterweight to the Doric Temple of Athena Parthenos. The architect may have been Meneskalus, but no inscription or later author confirms that. Construction began in the 430s BC and work continued intermittently during the Peloponnesian War. Despite the disaster of the Sicilian expedition, Athenian confidence persisted and some building programs were continued. In fact, most of the construction for the Erechtheion took place between 409 and 406 BC, partly because of the slope of the Acropolis, as well as because it had to be shaped accordingly to fit numerous religious shrines. It was not a conventional, peripteral temple. Regardless, it's considered a masterpiece of both classical sculpture and architecture. Like the Parthenon, we also have building accounts of the Erechtheion. As far as we can tell, the decoration on this building costs more than the building itself. So again, we see a great deal of lavish expenditure going on here, much like the Parthenon. But unlike the Parthenon, the Erechtheion actually held a proper religious function. It is believed to have been a replacement for the Pisistrated Temple of Athena Polius that was destroyed by the Persians, but it came to house more than one shrine. In addition to the large chamber dedicated to the old cult statue of Athena, there are also chambers for cults to Poseidon and Erechtheus, who the building derived its name from, and who was a legendary early king of Athens, believed to be the son of the mother earth goddess Gaia. According to the myth, it stands on the site of the battle between Athena and Poseidon over the patronage of Athens, in which each was tasked with giving a gift in the benefit of its people. Poseidon struck the ground with his trident, and a saltwater spring formed. Athena, however, gave an olive tree, which could be used for fruit, oil, and wood. Since Athena's was most useful, she won. The temple's eastern side held the shrine of Athena, called the Palladion, where an archaic cult wood statue of Athena had been located. This is the main entrance and is lined with six ionic columns. This may have been what the aforementioned temple of Athena Polius had covered. Its northern side enclosed the salt rock spring and sacred rock, which was believed to bear the marks of Poseidon's trident when he struck the ground. And so the northern side served the cult of Poseidon. Its western side shelters the area where the sacred olive tree of Athena was said to have been located. Although an olive tree actually stands on site today, it was planted in the early 1900s, so don't be fooled into thinking that this is that olive tree. The western side, though, served the cult of Erechtheus, and according to myth, was said to be where Athena's sacred snake lived. The snake was fed honey cakes by the Canophori, priestesses of Athena, as well as Artemis, both of whom are virgin goddesses. They were discussed in greater detail last episode. The snake's occasional refusal to eat the cakes was seen as a disastrous omen. The Erechtheion had multiple levels and projecting porches on either side, another unusual aspect. Little is known about the original plan of the interior, because it was destroyed by a fire in the 1st century BC and has been rebuilt several times, but it is believed that since the entire temple is on a slope, so that the west and north sides are about 9 feet lower than the south and east sides, then the entire interior would have been on the lower level, and the east porch was used for access to the great altar of Athena Polius, via a stairway and balcony, and also as a public viewing platform. Another way in which the Erechtheion was unique is that its friezes were made of black limestone from Eleusis. Also, it had elaborately carved doorways and windows. The northwest porch was widely hailed by later architects as the most perfect example of Ionic architecture. But the porch on the southwest side, the porch of the Caryatids, or maidens, is the most famous, in which six maidens, each wearing a peplos and carved using wet drapery technique, support the porch instead of ionic columns. Replacements can be seen on site, while five of the originals are found in the Acropolis Museum in order to preserve them. They were cleaned by a specially constructed laser beam, which removed accumulated soot and grime without harming the marble, and are displayed on a special balcony in the museum that allows visitors to view them from all sides. One of those five appears in worse condition than the others. 
Lord Elgin tried to remove it, but smashed it in the process. The fragments were left behind, and it was later reconstructed, haphazardly, with cement and iron rods. He did manage to successfully remove one caryatid, though, and so the sixth one is currently on display in the British Museum. In true classical fashion, they stand with one engaged and one free leg. The three on the left stand on their right foot, while the three on the right stand on their left. Doric capitals are placed above their heads, like baskets of goods, and so they appear to be representations of women carrying libation gifts. At its weakest possible point of architectural support, the neck has been strengthened with massive sculpted hairstyles, so that it is strong enough to hold up the entablature on her head. According to the Roman architect Vitruvius, the Caryatids were representations of the women of Carii, a town in Laconia, who were put to hold up the burden of the porch since they betrayed the Greeks during the Persian Wars. Vitruvius' explanation is doubtful because female figures were used as decorative supports in Greece, on treasuries at Delphi, for example, in the Near East well before the Persian Wars took place. Ancient Carii was the supposed hometown of the famed mythical queen Helen of Sparta, and girls from Carii were considered especially beautiful, tall, strong, and capable of giving birth to strong children. As we have discussed, Artemis had a significant cult following in Sparta amongst women. At a feast to Artemis, the Canophori supported a basket on their head that carried the sacred objects for the virgin goddess. Since under the porch of the Caryatids is the supposed tomb of Cecrops, an early archaic king of Athens, we can guess that they may be representations of priestesses to some sort of archaic shrine held there to Artemis or to Athena, who herself had Canophori priestesses. Whatever the origin may have been, the association with the Caryatids with slavery persisted though, and their later male counterpart is referred to as a telamon, such as those found in the temple of Olympian Zeus at Acragas. The practice of integrating Caryatids into building facades would be copied quite often by later Roman, Renaissance, and modern architects. The Recthion was burned in the 1st century BC by the Roman general Sulla, and it underwent extensive repairs during the early Roman Empire. The intact Erechtheon was extensively described by Pausanias, who wrote a century after it had been restored. The building was altered decisively during the early Byzantine period, when it was transformed into a Christian church. With this alteration, many architectural features of the ancient construction were lost, so that our knowledge of the interior arrangement of the building is limited. It became the residence of the Turkish commander's harem in the Ottoman period. While that definitely is a rub in the face, religiously speaking, at least the Ottoman Turks didn't store gunpowder in this temple, and so it isn't missing half of its exterior. However, that doesn't mean it was safe from harm. During the Greek War of Independence, the Erechtheon was bombarded by the Ottomans and severely damaged, as the ceiling of the northern porch was blown up and a large section of the walls of the cella was dismantled. It has been restored somewhat, though. So today, as visitors to the Acropolis enter through the Propylaea, one will see the smaller yet very unique Erechtheon on the left, and the massive Parthenon on the right. The Parthenon stands starkly isolated at the highest point of the rock, surrounded by a wasteland of broken marble somewhat resembling a stonecutter's yard. But in antiquity, many other buildings, temples, statues, and votive offerings adorn the Acropolis, though there are little remains of these monuments nowadays. To appreciate the effect that it would have presented in antiquity, one must imagine several other temples, sanctuary walls and altars, as well as a forest of dedicatory statues around and between these two temples. For example, there was a sanctuary of Artemis Brauronia, or the Brauronion, built around 435 BC that adopted the shape of an irregular rectangle and was located between the Parthenon and the Propylaea. Each year, in the sanctuary, young Athenian girls, around 10 years old, danced around the altar of Artemis, pretending to be she-bears. This was because Artemis was often associated as a representation of a bear in the deem of Brauron. There will be more on that in a future episode. According to Pausanias, a statue of Artemis made by Praxiteles in the 4th century BC stood in this sanctuary. We no longer have that statue, though. In fact, all that remains of the sanctuary are the foundations. There are other buildings and sanctuaries that have left almost nothing visible to the present day as well. The Halkotheca, which literally means bronze storeroom, and thus held the dedicatory offerings, is believed to have been near the Brauronion and the Parthenon, as evidence was found there in the form of a stella, inscribed with all of the objects contained within it. The Pandrosion, a sanctuary dedicated to Pandrosis, occupied the space between the Erechtheon and the old temple of Athena Polius. 
She was the only one of the three daughters of Kecrops who didn't open up the basket given to them by Athena that contained the infant Erechthonius, which we described last episode. The foundations of a sanctuary dedicated to Pandion, another legendary king of Athens, were found during the construction of the old Acropolis Museum, which sat on the southeast corner of the Acropolis. In addition, there are the foundations of a circular temple of Augustus built during the Roman period. As we mentioned, the Acropolis Restoration Project began in 1975 and is still ongoing. The aim is to reverse the decay of centuries of attrition, pollution, destruction stemming from military use, and misguided past restorations. The project includes collection and identification of all stone fragments, even small ones, from the Acropolis and its slopes, and the attempt is being made to restore as much as possible using reassembled original material, with new marble from Mount Penteli used sparingly. All restoration is designed to be completely reversible in case future experts decide to change things. A combination of cutting-edge modern technology and extensive research and reinvention of ancient techniques are being used. And so that's the Athenian Acropolis. The four buildings together mark the high point of the glorification of Athens, in the period when the city stimulated all kinds of creative genius, in architecture and sculpture, in the theater, in philosophy, and in historical writing. The Acropolis thus became a confident assertion of Athens' cultural leadership of Greece, a bold endorsement of her self-image, and a dazzling instrument of political propaganda. Many people later would consider the Athenian Acropolis to be the symbol of the Greek legacy and the glories of classical Greece. On the next episode, we will discuss the social, civic, and economic buildings that sprawled all around the Acropolis and start to discuss a little bit about urban Athenian life. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 66, The Athenian Agora. Thank you.